Well, good evening, everybody. Hope y'all are doing well tonight. This vast auditorium has filled every square inch. We're shoulder to shoulder in here. We can't move. We tried to social distance, but it didn't work. We're all in here packed like sardines floating in oil, but God is good. I'm just kidding. We are all socially distanced from each other. I being the furthest from all of you up here on this stage. So anyway, so glad that uh, you guys are here tonight. Those of you who are very, very socially distant from us uh, out there in TV land on Facebook, uh, welcome. So hope you enjoy this tonight. I know you're very disappointed Pastor Grant's not here. So am I. That was a joke. Nobody laughed in here. Hopefully you're laughing at home. Uh, Pastor Grant is enjoying a little downtime uh, with Miss Danny. They're having a good time. So talk to them today and uh, <clears throat> they miss you as well. So tonight we're going to talk about fire. How about that? Uh, fire is something that is something that you want to talk about um, in the middle of August uh, because who doesn't like a nice campfire, you know? Uh, the uh, my boys wanted to go camping a while back. Well, they didn't want to go camping. They were supposed to go camping with their troop. And uh, they were like, we don't want to go because it's so hot. It is so miserably hot. But I've got the air condition turned down a little extra low tonight. So as we talk about the heat, it's gonna, we're still going to still feel a little comfortable, okay? And so uh, we're going to talk about going forward uh, in the face of fire. So hmm, no thank you. Usually when you see fire... You run, right, the other way. There is a, uh, there's a clip that I watched about two weeks ago, and it was a fire breaks out, and there's a guy in the middle of the fire, and he pushes like this grandma out of the way. She falls to the floor, and he makes his way through. He opens the door, runs outside, and so when he's out at the fire truck, they're wanting to attack him, and he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. What looked like shoving was actually making a way, you know. He said, I wasn't, I wasn't going first. He said, I was making a way for all the women and children to exit from this children's birthday party <laughs> where this fire broke out. So pretty hilarious uh, uh, imagery. But that's what we do a lot of times is we run. You know, we run from fire. Nobody, nobody I've never seen a fire, maybe firefighters, obviously firefighters do this, but Never has there been a car on fire where somebody goes, let me go stand closer to it and see if that will fix something, you know? That's usually not what you do. You know, you'll get a fire extinguisher. I remember a guy's car caught on fire in our parking lot one time at the church, and we pulled a fire extinguisher out that hadn't been tested since the 80s and <laughs> held it to that car, and it just goes, <laughs> just kind of like dripped out of the end, so... Don't you worry. We keep our fire extinguishers tested frequently here, okay? But uh, at that certain time, that certain uh, extinguisher was not ready uh, to face the job. But oftentimes, when we see fire, we run. And then, when we make a fire in our house, what is it? It's cozy. It's wonderful. Oh, it's so comfortable. But there's a balance, right? Fire is good when it's in the right place, <laughs> You know, when it's in the right place, when it's under control, uh, and, it, and it never really is under control, right? It's, 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 it's just uh, we have, a, have a, a, a place that we respect it in our fireplace, but it is, uh, it's crazy. So anyway, um, so we're going to talk about going forward in the face of fire. Um, let's say a word of prayer before we get started. Father God, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given to us. We're thankful, God, that we can press forward and move forward by faith every single day in our lives in the face of trials, in the face of difficulties, difficult circumstances, in the face of adversity, in the face of pain and suffering and mishap. God, you show up and do something awesome in our lives, God. And uh, even when you don't do what we wanted you to do, uh, you do what's best for us. And we know that because you're a good father. Lord, we love you. We ask you to bless our time together tonight. In Christ, let me pray. Amen. Amen. Um, so tonight, I want to talk about fire, and Daniel chapter 3 is a great place to talk about fire. We're going to go there in just a minute and discuss that. But by this time in 2020, it's quite possible that you can't really see beyond today. Do you feel that way sometimes? I do. 
uh, normally you try to plan things out, right? You got your summer planned out. You've got your fall planned out. My wife is a planner. When I, actually, I called her a couple hours ago to check in on her. I said, well, what are you doing? She said, well, I've got my Excel spreadsheet and I'm working on my calendar. So she keeps everything by quadrants for the day and for the week and for the month and for the year. And she's just got it all uh, luck, you know, luckily she fits me into her schedule, so I really appreciate that. She's been uh, squeezing me in uh, every chance she got for 17 years, and so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so she is a planner, and this has been a very difficult time for her because you can't really plan anything, you know. It seems like everything's getting postponed and moved and canceled. And well, how about nine more weeks? How about 12 more weeks? How about another dozen weeks? How about we're not doing that? How about maybe later? How about don't touch me? How about you're too close? I saw a shirt the other day, and it said, if you can read this, you're standing too close to me. <laughs> I thought it was pretty hilarious. Of course, they never have my size in those types of things, but that's my cross to bear. But it's, if, if you can read this, you're standing too close to me. And um, so everything is different. Everything is, is crazy. The things that normally, you know, normally there are things that are set in stone, you know, like set in stone things are like, you know, Thanksgiving at grandma's, right? It's just like, don't even try to plan something somewhere else. You know you're going to be here. You like turkey and stuffing, and I will see you at 3 o'clock, okay? Those things, it seems like these days, this time that we're living in, those things aren't set in stone, and it begins to kind of roll everything around, and then all of a sudden, everything happens at once. And that's the thing that seems to be happening to me in my life, where nothing's planned, and then four things are planned in one day. And so it just kind of gets us all flustered, and we're trying to overcome these details that are overwhelming us, and we're finding it difficult some days to get back to our place, get back to that normal place, get back to that place where we're just kind of chilling out, you know? When Amanda was doing children's church, you know, I love to kind of go and chill out on Sunday afternoons. And Amanda was doing children's church on Facebook at 3 o'clock on Sundays. So by the time you did church here and then 8, you're right back. And so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm manning uh, our 2-year-old, making sure she's not interrupting everything and kind of keeping her going. And it was not a relaxing Sunday afternoon for anybody, right? It was a little bit more of a difference. So that's one thing now that we've opened Children's Church back up. That's one thing in our personal lives that we're able to kind of get back to a little bit more of a normal where Sunday afternoon is more about coffee and air conditioning. So, <clears throat> hallelujah. Um, <clears throat> so there's something, though, that drives us, right? There's something that drives us if you have... Uh, sometimes when you have difficulty to move forward, it's because nothing's pushing you forward, right? I have a determination when I get up in the morning time for two reasons. Number one, Amanda's going to be like, if I'm laying in, Amanda's going to be like, don't you have somewhere to be? Don't you have somewhere to be? And she's going to ask me that two or three times, and then my phone's going to ring. And it's going to be Grant Cole, and he'll be like, where are you, right? So those things that push us forward, those things... Are determining uh, are, are things that give us determination. Those responsibilities in our lives, right? If you lay out of work many days, then all of a sudden the mortgage company is calling you. They're looking for something as well, right? And so there are things that give us determination, and sometimes they're just innate. Sometimes they're in us, you know? I know that uh, when our children have been born, when they're little bitty babies, right, there's that determination that's just like somehow just inside of us. Well, I know it's inside of Amanda because, you know, she would not wake me up a lot of times. But, like, the baby gets up, she could hear a cry from, like, across the room through three floors. You know, she would hear a whimper, and she would go, oh, I know who that is. And she can tell the difference even today from, and I know you mamas can, right? You can tell the difference between I'm hurt, I'm mad, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm really hurt, I'm really mad. You know, there's all these levels of whimpers and cries and, and screams and, and things like that. And God knows those in us as well, right? God knows when we're really hurt. God knows when we're really scared. God knows when we're really fearful. And so we have to know that and understand that about him and who he is in our life. And so we are determined by different factors, you know? And so today, in talking about determination, we need faith, right? We need the faith that's necessary for success, okay? And I'm going to get into a really cool scripture here in a second. 
Uh, but we need the faith necessary for success uh, and the determination to stand in the midst of failure, right? So faith to say, this is the faith that I have, that I believe I can do this, and I'm going to make it through, and then I need to have the determination to know that if I fail, I can still stand, right? If I fail, I can still go forward. If there is a fire, I can still go forward. And I'm going to get into that real quick after this one story. My daughter, she's six years old, and she goes to our coffee table. It's a very large coffee table with drawers in it, full of blankets and toys. And she comes up, I come home one day, and she goes, Dad, check this out. And she grabs the coffee table, and she goes, and she lifts the coffee table, right? And so she's able to pick up two legs of the coffee table, and so in her mind, she's looking at her size compared to my size. And she's looking at the coffee table, and she asked me if I could pick up the house, right? And so in her mind, right, in her mind, she has this faith to believe. that. I, and I don't know how many things she tried to pick up before she got the nerve to say, let's try the coffee table, you know? And so she goes into the coffee table and goes to lift it up. And it's kind of like this thing that where... When we can do something and God helps us to do something and we have the strength to do something, that strengthens our faith to do more. That strengthens our faith to do the next thing. And we're like, if, if, with, with, with God's strength, if I could pick this up, what else can I do, right? What else, is there anything that God cannot do? You know, and so when we ask God, God, can you pick the house up? Yeah, you can pick the house up, Right? So when we ask God things, God can do those things, those crazy things that only a child would ask. God can do those things for us. And so it's when he doesn't do those things the way we thought he was going to do those things and we lose someone or something happens or we lose that job or someone gets hurt. Things happen in our lives all the time. And is God able? Yes. And when it doesn't happen the way we thought it was going to happen, we have to have that faith to continue, that determination to say, even though I feel like this is a failure, right? God has never failed me. I don't know about you, but God has never failed me. In the moment, I felt like he just forgot about me, but he never fails us. It's something that's a part of our process. It's something that's a part of life. It's something that's teaching us and strengthening us, and it cannot be something that we look to and feel like we have failed. So when we're talking about moving forward, Luke 9, <clears throat> verse 62, has a good message to us about moving forward. Jesus said to him, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. What he's saying is, once you have started, right? Another, another scripture that I don't have reference here for uh, says that uh, the calling of God is without repentance, right? That once God speaks and God calls, and God ordains, that is without repentance. He doesn't come back and say, I was just kidding. I realized how hard that was on you. And when I called you, I didn't really understand how difficult it was going to be for you. And so I'm going to, I take it back, right? There are no take backs with God in those, in those types of situations. And so what he's saying here, Jesus says it in a different way. He says, putting his hand to the plow and looking back, he is not fit for the kingdom of God, right? That once we are going, once we are plowing that road, right? Once we are moving forward, once we are doing that work, we cannot look back and say, oh, look at this, oh, look at this. I remember as a young man, <clears throat> when I was stepping into a ministry role, out of a role of working in construction, I thought I was the champ. I thought, man, look at this. Look at what I've done for God, right? Foolishness, right? It was the foolishness of a child, the mentality that I had in that way, because as time progressed, I saw that God had called me into something that was more, something that was greater, something that was far, far more for me and for what God had designed me for than what I was doing, right? And so in the end, you look back, and not even in the end, I'm just, I'm barely getting started. I look back and I say, wow, what a decision that I made that God uh, uh, moved forward, God called, God moved uh, into my life and, and, and gave me the determination, right? Strengthened my faith to move forward in this. And so as a, as a young kid, I was looking back saying, oh man, 
look at what I've given up for God. And I kept looking back and said, well, look at what I've given up for God. And very quickly, I realized I had not given up anything for God, but God had paved a way, right? Have you ever seen, have you ever, have you ever seen uh, God just paving a way for you? That all of a sudden things just start to, things start to work out and you're just like, there's no way that this is anything but God working this out. Amen? <clears throat> all right, now to Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to bounce around in Daniel chapter, chapter 3. We're going to start in uh, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. In verse 4, it says, Then he heralded, loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Verse 7, Therefore at that time when all peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Verse 8 says this, For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. Verse 12, There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, these men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. Verse 13, Nebuchadnezzar was raged. He was mad. He was angry. Many of us know this story. We're going to drop down to verse 17. Uh, 16. She so, okay, let me tell you this. So he says, there is a fire that I have got for you. Because you knew, about, and they knew about this fire, right? They knew that if they didn't bow when the music was played, <clears throat> that there was a fire for them and that whoever did not worship Nebuchadnezzar's idol was going to be thrown into the fire. But they had a determination that they had established a long time before that they were going to do the things that they needed to do, right? To be a part of Babylon. They were going to do the things that had to be done to just be members of this society. But they were not going to forsake God. They were not going to forsake who God is and who they knew to be in his sight and in his kingdom. Once they had set their hand to the plow, they were not going to turn around. So they went forward in the midst and in the middle of a, of, a, uh, uh, of a death threat, right, of this fire. They said, we're pushing forward. We do not care because God is our king, right? God is more important to us. We've lost a lot of stuff. We're here in Babylon. We've lost a lot of things. The people of God had lost a lot of things, but they had not lost their bearings as to who God was. At least these men, amen? A lot of times when the world has their own set of rules and their own set of expectations and their own set of the ways things that should go, a lot of times we get to a place where we feel like, well, what are you going to do, right? What are you going to do? This is such a cool story because these three boys did not just sit back and say, hey, you know what I'm saying? What are you going to do? Let's just bow down. They refused to say, let's just bow down. And something really, really cool happened. <clears throat> So he says, bow down. And in 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. That's pretty awesome. He was like, y'all need to, y'all need to, are, when he, if they see, because what he said was, he said, next time you hear it, are you going to bow down? And they were like, no, we don't even need to answer you, okay? Because we're going to go ahead and tell you this. If it be so that you're going to do this to us, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. 
But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. And so here's what they say. They say God is going to deliver us, right? God is going to set us free from your hand. We will not die. We will not bow, and we will not die. God is going to take care of us. That is the faith that has given them the determination to stand up against what was a society norm. That when the the music sounded, everybody bowed. And these guys said, nope. Where were they? Were they in the chow line waiting to get some food? And then all of a sudden, just like, scut up, up, boo, boo, you know, they start playing the song, and they're like, everybody starts bowing down. And when everybody bows down, you know, they're the only one left standing up, you know. It looked about like when I went to, I remember going to Tiananmen Square in Beijing, China, and I stood out like a sore thumb, okay, because nobody was my height or my size in that whole little square. So it wasn't like, uh, I think it might have been that guy, right? So I couldn't get away with nothing, okay? I couldn't get away with anything. And so it's kind of like that whenever something happens where everybody bows down and you're left standing there in the middle, you're like, well, I can't get away with this. You know, obviously we're doing this. They had that kind of faith and that was what gave them the determination to say, you know what, he is going to deliver us. Here's how they prepared themselves for a possible failure of this plan, okay? This was their plan, but their failure of this plan was, even if he does not, let it, to, let it be known that we will not bow down. So they had the faith that God was going to deliver them, but they said, you know what, even if he doesn't, he's more important to us than to bow down even though it might seem insignificant. I remember there was a school shooting when I was, I think I was still in school. No, I was still in school. I was my senior year of high school. The Columbine High School shootings happened. And when that happened, I had this thought. I'm 17 years old, right? I'm thinking, why not just lie, right? Right? If somebody's got a gun to your head and they're like, hey, you know, I'm like some crazy kid is holding a gun to your head and says, deny Christ or I'm going to shoot you in the head. I was like, just lie and then be like, God, I'm so sorry. I did not mean that, right? And there's something that I learned from that moment of like that right there is a determination to say, I will not deny God, right? I will not deny God. And And I remember having a, I remember having a conversation, it was the next year, uh, first year in college, I met a girl who was from, uh, who was from um, a, uh, another school that had a shooting and had a similar type experience, and she was going, she literally was processing this, right, in the middle of a shooting. She had heard about the other shooting, and she's in the middle of this saying, what will I do? Like, what, like what, what will I say? When they, if, they, if, they, if they grab me, will I say the same thing? So, this is more important for them, right? God's done so much for his people. God's done so much for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They know that he's real. They know that he is their God. He is their king. And they say, we will not bow. Bowing to another idol, bowing to another god, bowing to another king, bowing to something else in our life or in our system of our world is not just okay, right? It's not just okay for us to do that and think that way. I've learned a lot from 17 years old, right? That like surely, surely if someone came in here in that same way, I would not say, oh, just kidding, right? Surely I've progressed enough. Surely we, and we all want to ask ourselves that question. Like, surely we've progressed enough to the level of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or to those brave kids who said, No, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. Do what you want, right? Sometimes we don't know. We think we know. We're pretty sure we know. I'm 99% sure, but I don't have a gun to my head. I don't have a fiery furnace in front of me, right? And so we have to think about 
the little decisions that we're making every single day. We have to think about the little commitments that we're making every single day. We have to look at the little things that we may be ignoring or bowing to every single day. And once we look at those little things, they can kind of help us give a barometer of what we do if something big was in front of us, right? To what, what we would do, how we would live for God, how we would speak up for God in those ways. Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, obviously, at this moment, that his facial expression was altered. Thought of my dad when I read this. My dad would get mad and his facial expression was altered. Have you ever done that? Little, like, little, you know, where it's just like all of a sudden it's just like all this weight's on one side of your face and you're just kind of like, oh, I can't right now, you know? And I think, I'm pretty sure I probably have that face too. You have to ask my sons. Uh, but it says his facial expression was altered, okay, because he was so angry. He gave orders to have the furnace heated seven times hotter than it was. It was so hot that when the guys threw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, the guys that threw them in there were killed. That's hot. So they threw them in, and they looked, and the three men that fell into the midst of the blazing furnace were still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded, and he stood up in haste. He said to his high officials, Was it not three men that we cast bound into the midst of the fire? If the fire was that hot that it killed the guys that threw them in there. I could see if there was two guys left in there, and you having a question, right? Didn't we throw three in there? Now there's two. Wow, the other one burn up quick, okay? No. Usually, when you throw something into the fire, multiplication doesn't happen, okay? Usually, our addition doesn't happen, you know? There's not usually more things that you throw into the fire. So he said, he said uh, was it not three men we cast into the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loose and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. You servants of the Most High God. What? Oh, man, Mr. 60 Cubits gold idol in the middle of town that when you hear the bagpipes, everybody's got to stop what they're doing and bow down. Mr. I'm so awesome. Everybody love me and pay me attention. I'm Nebuchadnezzar. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to Babylon. Haven't you heard? This guy all of a sudden stands up and he is just like, what? He was like, yo, servants of the Most High God, these boys, listen to me, these boys had been called by a name that was not their name. You, you remember that? In Daniel chapter 1, they were renamed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they had been answering to their Babylonian names. They said, you can call me something different. I know who my mama named me. I know who I am in God. And you know what? I'm just going to just answer to your name. That's fine. You can have that. But I will not bow down to your idol. I will not serve your gods. I will not eat the meat that has been given and sacrificed to these gods. And all of a sudden, what music to their ears to hear the king say, servants of the Most High God. He has now recognized who they really are. He did not say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He said servants of the Most High God. And then that has got to be such a fulfilling and awesome thing for these guys to say, yes, we told you he was going to save us. And now you recognize who's really in charge of this whole thing. Amen? <sighs> All right. So he said, you guys have got to get out of here. Uh, no, what was he saying? Hold on a second. I am lost here. Um, I jumped forward a little bit. King Where are we? Okay, I am so sorry. Okay. <clears throat> Servants of the Most High God, come here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. The satraps and prefects and the governors of the king's officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. 
nor was the hair of their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor did they even have the smell of fire had even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who put their trust in him, violating the king's command, and yielded up their bodies so as to not serve or worship any god except their own. Therefore, I make, we're in verse 29, therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their house is reduced to a rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other God who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the land. Now, I'm going to tell you something. That is profound. That is an awesome example for us, right? He was learning, okay? <laughs> so here's the deal. Nebuchadnezzar, he didn't have like a transformation experience. You get that, right? Where he's like, oh, okay, okay, okay. You guys aren't going to die. I'm going to take care of you guys. You guys are awesome, okay? You guys rock. Uh, let's see, what else? Anybody that talks bad about you, I'm going to kill them, okay? I'm not going to kill you guys. You guys are good, okay? But anybody that talks bad about your God, I'm going to rip them limb from limb. So he's not really transformed, okay? He's not really crossed the finish line. He's not really started what we call the sanctification process, okay? And so he is not really, he's not really moving forward. It's a baby step, okay? He's acknowledging that there is a God, he is acknowledging that he is powerful. He is acknowledging that he really loves these three guys. He's acknowledging that, that anybody that wants to worship him is more than welcome to worship him. Because anybody that's got that kind of power and clout for just these three little dudes could take us all out. So let's just honor their God, right? These were his baby steps. But something happened here. And the thing that happened here was he, <clears throat> there was a little transformation that was taking place, right? There's just a small, just a tweak, just to start. Have you ever seen that happen in a friend of yours? Have you ever seen that happen in a family member where they see God show up in your life? They see something happen in your life. They see your response when something devastating happens to you, when something difficult happens to you, and they get around you and they don't smell the fire, they don't smell the smoke. They don't see singed garments, right? So y'all understand I'm talking theoretically. You've not actually been in a fire. Okay. <laughs> so, but they don't smell it. They're like, something's, something's not right. You've been through something. You should respond differently. You should look differently. You should act differently. And you should say, you know what? We're not, I'm, not just, I'm not just playing this thing by myself, right? I'm not going through this by myself, right? There is this fourth man in the fire. There's someone who has saved me. And I don't just say that in a loose term. I mean it in a literal term that there is someone who has saved me from myself. Saved me from the clutches and the grips of this world. So understand this, that when we talk about salvation, it is a way of salvation, right? It is a way of salvation. It is a life. It is something that once we have been saved, we are constantly being saved. It's a journey that we are on, right? And so we have faith that starts this journey. We don't know. We saw them. We saw that. We saw that. Well, now we have faith that starts a journey and that determination to continue through success and in the midst of failure that a lot of times we just consider failure, that God doesn't see as failure, right? God sees it as just life that we're learning from and we're getting over and we're pressing through. Amen? And so when people see us and they say, wow, they don't even smell like smoke. They don't even, their clothes aren't even singed. There could have been so many things that could have happened to them in the midst of this. They are encouraged, right? And then this could be a start for them. This could be a, just a, a small spark, something to start something in them to see a transformation because of how we respond, because of how we act. To say, you know what? They didn't bow 
to the world and what the world was doing. They didn't bow to all these things. And in the midst of all that, everyone was bowing. And I saw them standing up. And I thought they looked stupid. And I thought they looked foolish. And I thought they were crazy. But now I see that they were not. Now I see that I'm the crazy guy with a 60-foot statue of gold, or 60 cubits, how many inches that is, right, in the middle of town. Maybe I'm crazy. I thought they were crazy, and maybe I'm crazy. And later he does go crazy, but that's another story all in and of itself. <clears throat> Luke 9, 57. No, 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 I'm sorry. Matthew 9, 35 through 38. My notes here, you don't have notes, so follow along. I'm just kidding. I was telling them earlier, I don't have notes for you tonight because if I give you notes and I don't follow those notes, then you get all judgy and you're like, why is he not following his notes? Why do you write that in there if he's not going to talk about it? And then I get all worried. So we're just going to kind of go here and I get to go on all my little rabbit trails and lose myself in my notes and everybody's cool. Y'all don't know. All right. (laughs) So my notes say this. It's time for no more excuses. Well, that doesn't sound good. (laughs) Let's go. Let's continue. The Father does not call. Y'all have heard this before. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. If you've not heard it before, you may have lived in a hole. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously. The Father does not call the equipped, but rather he equips the called. Have you heard this before? Right? That God doesn't call people that have all the tools they need. He doesn't call people. When I want a job done, I call somebody that has all the tools. Right? My neighbor has got a chainsaw that's like this long. Okay? And he's got a bobcat, and he's got a really big truck, okay? So when I wanted trees cut down in my yard, did I call my dad, who's got like a little chainsaw about this long, and a little pickup truck? No. No, I called the guy that's got the tools, you know what I'm saying? He's ready. He's equipped. Let's do this, okay? He's ready for the job. And he got the job done because he had all the tools. But God, on the other hand, just calls fishermen. And God, on the other hand, just calls people just hanging out under trees. And God, on the other hand, just calls people who are 17, 18 years old, don't know what in the world they're going to do with their life, and goes, hey, you, follow me, right? God calls us at whatever point in our life, at whatever time in our life, for whatever he has lined up for us, God calls us, we step out, and we're like, oh, I'm not ready. I'm not, no, not me. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, exactly not you, because of that very reason. You think you can't do it on your own. You think you don't have the equipment to do it, and you are correct, right? If you will just hang out with me, and if you will have faith, and if you'll go on this journey with me, I'm going to begin to put those tools in your hand. I think about um, Nehemiah. Nehemiah has this idea to rebuild this wall, but he has no resources to rebuild this wall. It wasn't like he was just sitting around with all the money in the world going, I don't think I'm going to rebuild the wall. I mean, I got all the money in the world. Why not? People need a wall, you know? That's not what he did. He didn't have the resources, but he had the desire, he had the vision, and he said, let's do this wall. And he got the resources, right? God gave him favor, and he got the resources to rebuild this wall, right? And so that's kind of how it happens with us. We don't have the resources to do what God's called us to do. We have this passion, this desire, this fire. Just like, oh, I want to do this, you know? And then all of a sudden, God uses us, right? In sometimes the simplest of ways. I'll give you you an example right now. On the way here tonight, um, we found out there was a lady who got an apartment. She had a three-bedroom apartment. And as they were... As they were moving her into the apartment, they were like, so uh, when are you moving in? You know, when, where's your stuff? She's like, I've got my kids, an air mattress, and two gray blankets, right? This is all this lady had. She had, I mean, three or four kids. I don't know. They're running all over the place, <laughs> right? And so she has nothing, right? Now, the cool thing is, is that like, wouldn't we all just love to just go like fill our apartment full of cool stuff? Man, that'd be awesome, Right? But I don't have the money to go fill our apartment with cool stuff, right? I don't have the resources to do that, but God does, right? God does. And so we have had all this stuff donated this past, I don't know, the past week or so. Nice stuff. I'm talking about like Broyhill, 
uh, Sealy Posturepedic hybrid, okay? I mean, things that you've never, I'm like, wow, that's amazing, you know? Really great stuff that we've had donated over the past few weeks, right? And we were able tonight to load it into a truck that's not my truck, right? Those aren't my things, you know, and so all of a sudden, I don't have I don't have the stuff, the resources, or whatever to help this lady out. Neither did the leasing agent at the apartment, but God did, right? And so God knew who to call. God knew uh, before she even moved in, all of this stuff was already on hand. And so me and the guys went over there this afternoon. And we gave her a queen bed for her, a queen bed for her daughter, twin beds for her boys, a reclining sofa. The reclining sofa we had literally got like an hour before, you know. And then when we, here's where she really lost it, okay. She was so grateful. She was so excited. Tomorrow we're bringing lamps and dining table and so much more stuff. But here's where she really lost it. When we brought fabric-covered headboards in for her boys, right? That's when she was done. She's like, I can't even talk. Oh, my goodness. Because that's, that's the God that we serve, right? That's the God that we serve. He, he has got things stored away, ready. So we're in the middle of going like, this is cool, right? And then, and then all of a sudden, oh, I've got a bed. Oh, that's great. Oh, no, I've got beds for everybody. We're not having to share beds, right? This is amazing. We were going to sleep on the floor. Oh, wait a second. You've brought headboards, right? I'm telling you, I serve a God that has headboards, amen? I serve a God that has stuff stored up for us, stuck away, and in the middle of a fire, in the middle of a difficult circumstance where one thing has gone right. She got an apartment, right? That's one thing. That's one thing, right? All of a sudden, in a matter of hours, she's flooded with all these wonderful things that were of no resource of mine. They were of nothing. To, I was just glad we were able to have the, the muscle and the time and, the, and for, for God to use us as a conduit, right? Pastor Grant always says that benevolence is a bridge, right? Is a bridge between man and God. And that's what we're doing, right? Those, those opportunities that we have to say, you know what? I just want to be that bridge to say God is good, right? God is good in the midst of all of our circumstances. And so wherever you are tonight that you're thinking, maybe you're just like, if I just had this, right? God's got one more thing for you, right? He's got a headboard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? God's got something extra. Whatever you're waiting on, whatever you're looking for, right? God's got something extra. And it might not end up being exactly what you're praying for or what you're wanting or what you're desiring. But as we have faith to say, you know what? In the midst of a difficult circumstance, I can't put anything on my calendar right now because everything is crazy. Everybody's going, everybody's running, everybody's running nuts. To mask or not to mask, to distance or not to distance. I don't know what to do. I can't, I can't walk in a restaurant anymore. All the buffets are closed. All these things that are going on in our current life and situations, and I'm just naming some just like out there things. We're talking about people losing their jobs, people getting uh, unemployment checks cut off right now that, they were, that were a big blessing for a little while. All of these things that people are going on, all this stuff is real, tangible stuff, Right? And in the middle of it, we look and go, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? What is God going to do? I want to tell you this. He's done it over and over and over and over and over again in my life. And I can tell by the shaking of the heads in here in your life as well. God has a headboard, right? He has something extra, okay? There is a fourth man in the fire, okay? There is somebody else. He is the God among, above all gods, right? He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And as my father used to always say, he owns the hills under the cattle as well. Okay? I'm telling you, he is the God of resource. He is the God of strength. He is the God of encouragement in the middle of whatever we're going through. Right? That we just have the faith and the determination to say, I'm pushing through today. Right? I'm pushing through today because God is is more than enough. And I will not bow to the world systems. I will not bow. I may look stupid standing here while everybody else is bowing. I may look stupid standing here while everybody else is doing God knows what, but I will not do it. I will not bow because God is good and I will serve him and none other. Do whatever you want to to me, right? Do whatever you want to to me. God will see me through. And if he doesn't, I still won't do it. Amen.
Amen? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this time together in your word. God, we're so grateful that you have more than what we're expecting. That you have a headboard waiting for us. God, we're so grateful that, that in the midst of we don't know what, a fourth man shows up in the fire. And everyone around us looks and says, that is a servant of the Most High God. Because God showed up in their darkest hour. Show up in our darkest hour. Show up in every hour. Show up when we need you. Show up when we don't think we need you, God. God, I pray that when you do show up, we'll see you. We will recognize you because you are like none other. God, let us stand like no other. So when you come in like no other, God, we will recognize it was you. We'll make eye contact with you, God, because we see you walk in because we're not bowing. We're not bowing when everyone else is bowing, but we're standing, waiting, looking to the heavens for you that when you show up, we'll be the first to see you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. All right, well, you guys have a great week, and we're going to hang out here and talk for a minute in the air conditioning.